Yes, indeed, uh, I am a photographer, although not only a photographer anymore today. Uh, I'm also a filmmaker. Let's say I'm a visual storyteller, but because of photography, it's difficult to make a living on if it's just that. Um, I'll take you on a, f a short journey. I understood I have two hours. So, uh, <laughs> right? Almost. Okay, uh, I'll be quick. Um, yes, uh, I've been a, a photographer for over 30 years, uh, working uh, in the traditional press. I started as an analog photographer, covered a lot of conflicts in Africa and the Middle East and uh, elsewhere. And for the last uh, 15, 10, 15 years, my work has been much more on environmental issues and issues about the climate crisis, because I do feel that this is uh, there's something huge coming to us and somehow if we talk about the climate crisis we think and I rather call it the crisis than uh, climate change uh, we seem to think that it's not going to be as bad as being predicted well so far it doesn't look good um, do we see something Yes, we do. Um, I'll take you first on, on, a, on a short trip uh, where I was wondering, I'm from Amsterdam, I put my garbage uh, on, the, on, the, on the curb twice a week, and uh, I was wondering where is my garbage, where is my waste going to actually. So I went on a trip to, uh, to six mega cities, uh, basically looking how uh, waste is managed and particularly mis mismanaged. Because like here in Amsterdam, it looks pretty clean nowadays. Uh, and uh, actually, um, we are producing more and more waste than we ever did before. So uh, I went to Jakarta, to Lagos, to uh, Tokyo, to Sao Paulo, to New York, all cities over 15 million people, and to Amsterdam, because it's my hometown. Um, it was quite incredible uh, to work on this and, and, and quite incredible to see actually uh, how much we waste and how much we don't recycle. I think there's slowly coming an awareness, but, uh, but the problem is massive. Um, difficult to, to get access because uh, many, uh, many of the companies who manage waste are uh, private companies, especially in New York. It was enormously difficult to get access. Uh, which you see here. Um, nevertheless, uh, it, uh, it became not only a publication, uh, which I will show you shortly in the Washington Post, which was uh, quite incredible that they did this because they, did, they made a special supplement out of it. Uh, and they published it on Thanksgiving, which, as they said, is America's most wasteful weekend. Uh, so, uh, um, and for me, you know, I mean, it's still important to work, to work for, the, for the media because if, if, you, if you publish in a publication like the Washington Post, uh, you reach about 40 million people, uh, and then it's online as well, and it, uh, and it and continues to be, uh, to be viewed, and, and is in that sense quite impactful, I noticed. Um, Apart from, from publishing in traditional media, and obviously things changed a lot in my career. I started as an analog photographer. Uh, it became all digital now. Uh, it's, it's publications in the, in the press, but it's also exhibitions and it's, uh, and it's books. So um, I'll show you the, what, the, what the Washington Post did. First is, this was, uh, we did an exhibition um, which was uh, designed by Cameron Herman, which is a great Dutch design team. Uh, this is the north of Amsterdam, next to the I Film Museum. Uh, I'm sure many of you know it, and we managed to get the permission to put these containers on the, um, actually on the street. It was an exhibition for, I believe, uh, three months. Uh, images on the on the containers and and we trans transformed the inside not only with images but also uh, with short film clips for short video clips um, 
for me, it's great to, to do an exhibition like that because it's, you know, it's out on the street, it's out uh, in your face. So, you know, whether you like it or not, you will, you will pass it and you will probably stop by to just have a, have a look. Um, so for me, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's all about having impact as well and to have people uh, see it and, and just have a moment to, to look at it. So th this was what the Washington Post did. It was a supplement, as I said. Uh, and then online, obviously, much more happens because uh, it's also video and sound and, uh, um, and text, obviously. Not bad for a newspaper to give such a huge space to a photographer. Um, yes, I, I was introduced actually uh, about uh, this project, which is called, first it was called Where Will We Go? And now I call it Art for Us, the Deluge. Uh, it's a project I've w been working on on and off uh, for 10 years uh, and basically looking at, at the consequences of the rising sea level. Um, it was a collaboration with the New York Times at that time, uh, which was quite brave uh, from them because, you, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, I think now if I speak about a rising sea level, most of you know what I'm talking about. 10 years ago, that was definitely not the case. So colleagues of mine and friends of mine, they were kind of staring, what, what is this guy talking about? Um, and for me, that was initially also, I mean, I thought that this was, would be an issue in the, for the next generation or the generation after, and I didn't realize it, uh, that this was happening today already. And it was because I came, I was working on another project, I came to these beautiful islands called the San Blas Islands, Cunayala, in Panama, and I was interviewing people there and they said, we are being evacuated. And I said, why are you being evacuated? And they said, the sea is coming. I said, what do you mean, the sea is coming? I live in Amsterdam, we are on the bottom of the sea, la on the bottom of the sea. Uh, and they said, you know, the sea level is rising. So that was for me kind of an eye opener that I realized that this is happening today and not in the future. And it's happening today also because you don't have to wait for the water to come into the room and then it's time to leave. If the land uh, floods frequently, uh, people can't grow their crops anymore. There's no safe drinking water. So that's why, why many, many people in, uh, uh, in different parts of the world are either being evacuated by their governments or, uh, or are leaving themselves. And it's not just happening far away. I mean, this is the east coast of, uh, of the UK. Uh, it's eroding, nothing new about erosion. Uh, but they're losing two, three meters a year now. Uh, because of the sea currents changing, because of the sea level rising. Um, so the UK is getting thinner and thinner. They call it Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kiri Bus, anyone who knows where it is, uh, it's between Fiji and Hawaii, super remote. Uh, one of the island nations, and it's... Uh, it's disappearing very rapidly, and it's being predicted that it will be completely gone, probably already by 2050. And it's a nation, and we haven't talked about what we do with disappearing nations. Um, well, Miami, uh, Miami has a problem, as uh, some of you might know. It's built on limestone. So whatever seawall dike you build to protect it, the water will just go under. So forget about Miami, don't buy property, um, which s still a lot of people do. Um, so it, it is a very, you know, I, I became, I want to cheer you up this morning, but it's not completely happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's. I think it's like, you know, I mean, I became very worried as well. Also because I, I live in the Netherlands and it seems even we, the Dutch, who are supposed to be the best experts in the, in the world, considering uh, talking about water management or, or coastal protection. Also the Netherlands, uh, if we 
can't bring this temperature on this planet down, as we all agreed back in Paris already, uh, the Netherlands is, is going to face one, two, three meters by the end of the century, um, which would be possible that uh, if you do it again in Amsterdam, what design can do, uh, it might move to the east of the Netherlands because Amsterdam might be relocated by then. Um, as I said, you know, I mean, this is a, I didn't want to do a book initially, uh, so I uh, decided to publish a newspaper, self-published, self, uh, self and it became an ex exhibition at the Maritime Museum here in Amsterdam, and uh, we made projections, which you will see in a second, um, which is two projectors who are in an angle, and, uh, and kind of pull you into the, into the story. So it was uh, 400 square meters at the museum. Um, so these are, are the screenings, the projections. Uh, great actually to show the work there because uh, every school in Amsterdam needs to come to this museum. So I gave a lot of, uh, of uh, tours to, to school kids who know actually a lot more than many of us uh, and are getting pretty pissed off that we are not acting as we should do. And um, Last but not least, it became, uh, it became a book, and which was for me, you know, I, the problem I have with photo books is that they, uh, it's kind of elite, elitist, because they're quite expensive. So, you know, I really think that for me, it's a task all to think, who's my audience? So this was an attempt to make not a photo book. Uh, so it's kind of an anti-photo book, although there's a lot of images in it. Um, but I asked authors, scientists, activists, politicians, but all from, from the, to talk about their own region. Um, so it became more like a scientific, journalistic, and uh, illustrated by, uh, by my own images. Um, I don't know if we can get it here. Can we get it here? <laughs> anyway, you can find it. Uh, so. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I have to say it, it became pretty successful because, uh, you know, normally you don't sell a lot of photo books and this is in the second edition already. Um, and, um, and I'm writing a children's book now. How to make them not depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Super sharp shooter shooting super, super, super sharp shots. Here we have time for two short questions, and I, uh, I have five, so I'm going to just jump straight in. Um, maybe, maybe touch upon uh, this point you bring forward on action. I'm assuming, uh, or maybe let's pose it as a question, how do people respond to, the, to your work, and um, how, how can they somehow understand the sense of ownership for this question, or even a word as responsibility. Is there such thing, or who do you think is in the lead in, when you talk about action? You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting to, to see what's happening, you know? I mean, I, I very much feel like a, a journalist, not like an artist, but it, it's often that people, especially if it's about a topic like this, uh, and that's usually coming from populist parties that they try to the, the disqualify you. So it's often, I get often the question, uh, are you n not more an activist than a journalist? Which is often meant, you know, people can label me or me what they want, but it's kind of to, often feels like it's to be disqualified. Uh, yeah. So I'm calling myself an active journalist. An active journalist. But somewhere in the, um, in the, um, in the writings that I prepared, uh, while reading into your practices, it me you mentioned very much this idea of that we should all somehow, partially, 
change our behavior, but it's also a political stand. And I'm very happy that you mentioned this idea of that even in the Netherlands, you know, we, we have to think through notions of drought. It's not only flooding, uh, there's salination. So there's a whole water cycle connected to what you've been investigating. The last question I was wondering about um, is the, the climate migrant, is, are they uh, acknowledged as a as an entity, or is it, does it have any legal status? No, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I, I very briefly mentioned uh, about Kiribati, that it's a nation, that it's disappearing. We talk about climate refugees, but there's no, you know, there's nothing which, which says that you can grant, that, that asylum will be granted for those reasons. There's been one family from this islands who was granted asylum first case in New Zealand, it went to the Supreme Court and uh, because they, they got the asylum and then in the su Supreme Court it was uh, destroyed and they were deported back. So, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> we talk about refugees and obviously we all see what's happening today and what's been happening over the last few years, but you know, I mean, many of us, including maybe the Dutch who live in, in the West, will be, you know, start learning German. You know, yeah. I mean, and it's beautiful <laughs> on the east side of the Netherlands. Way too short, but thank you so much. Please give it up one more time for Mr. Kadir Volohaj.